Recently, we've started to see more commentary that claims that there aren't the resources to decarbonise through electrification. At the same time, we've also seen headlines about how harmful mining is and the discussion of how much environmental damage is done extracting lithium, nickel, cobalt and manganese for, in particular, EV batteries has become inescapable. The question is, do those articles and videos fall into the same disinformation group as the plethora of videos and headlines that claim that we're just going to chuck dead EV batteries in the ground after we've used them for 10 minutes, having despoiled the earth to make them, which we've debunked before, or is there more to them? So we're going to take the plunge and dive into mining. I mean, not literally, that would be unwise, although I did used to love spelunking with my parents. In today's video we're going to try something new, because I use a lot of different resources and sources to, you know, prove that what I'm saying isn't just made up. We're doubling down on our efforts to make it easy for you to engage in some follow-up reading after watching this video. That means putting links in the description, but we're also going to try out putting QR codes on screen so that you can, if you're watching this on a TV or computer, point your mobile phone at the screen and it'll take you to the right point. Hang on, I'll demonstrate it now. Just go and point your camera phone at this, and voila, a link to our Patreon page, just in case you'd like to support us. I'll wait a few moments for you to try that out. Great, so whenever you see this, you know that it's time to grab your phone and start link diving. The first one is coming up in a few moments. So I guess the first question is, are there really enough resources? In 2021, Bloomberg predicted that by 2035, 50% of all new vehicle sales would be EVs, and that date's shuffled forward a few years in its 2022 update. To be honest, as with solar panels, predictions are usually pretty conservative and often underestimate the actual uptake of a new technology. But as it stands, those estimates for electrification are nowhere near where we need to be to get to net zero and decarbonise quickly enough to keep our spinning lump of rock habitable. But it is, shall we say, better than no improvement. Anyhow, the amount of available lithium on our bit of the unfashionable western spiral arm has been estimated by the US Geological Survey to be 86 million tonnes. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but estimates suggest that it's enough to carry us through to the middle of the century in terms of electrification. Assuming, that is, that we stick with lithium. And of course, then there's cobalt, which, thanks to increased extraction, and reduced demand, yeah, reduced demand, because both demand for electronics has dropped and EV manufacturers have reduced or removed cobalt from battery chemistries, so it's seen its price drop to less than half of its price in 2022, near historic lows, a price so low that it has led to some mines closing. But since it's mostly obtained as a byproduct of extraction of other minerals, nickel and copper for example, those mine closures aren't a huge concern as yet. All that said, last year's report from the IEA does suggest that there are some challenges to overcome. Despite long-term astonishing falls in the prices of batteries and their component minerals, last year it saw a bump which pushed the price of batteries up for the first time. Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine, while there is some suggestion it may have actually improved our timeline for net zero, has in particular temporarily nudged up the price of nickel, as well as hopefully briefly reversed our trend towards fossil fuel decline. Also cited in the report is the need for immediate term investment in mining, where while minerals are available to meet projected demand based on current policies at least until the end of the 2020s, more rapid EV adoption will see a need for more extraction and more widespread recycling. IEA identifies that if worldwide climate pledges were made into actual policies, what it calls the announced pledges scenario, the supply gap for lithium would grow to 500 kilotons by 2030, which using traditional extraction methods would require 50 extra quote, average sized mines. 
if we actually want to hit net zero in time to avert the worst of climate change, then we're going to need to reduce emissions and electrify transportation even faster than those pledges suggest. But it's important to realise that alternative mineral extraction options exist, and as those projects move from demonstration and research into commercial use, we're going to see a shift away from traditional mining being the only source. One particularly interesting development is in ongoing work to extract lithium from seawater, a process which, if successfully commercialised, would meet all of our needs. And we've previously covered projects extracting lithium from brine in existing abandoned mines, or by drilling small boreholes, pumping out fluid, passing it through iron exchange membranes, then returning the fluid. Anyhow, citing a report from Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, IEA states that announced and planned manufacturing capacity is sufficient to meet battery demand out to 2030. Under existing policies, projections look to require 2.2 terawatt hours by 2030. If we pass all our fancy words into law, then we need about 3.5 terawatt hours, and expected that is announced or planned manufacturing capacity looks to exceed 4.6 terawatt hours. Now, that all assumes that we're going to stick with lithium batteries, but for cost purposes we may see some development of aluminium air batteries, or aluminium air batteries I suppose, which have definite issues related to not currently being rechargeable, but which a lot of the mainstream press like because you get big numbers. Or sodium ion based batteries which honestly look a lot more hopeful. Cattle, that's C-A-T-L, have already stated that it expects for vehicles with ranges up to around 400 kilometres, that's 250 miles, it expects that battery supply will be met by sodium ion batteries. And the first EV with a sodium ion battery, a testbed version of the Seahol E10X built by a Volkswagen and JAC joint venture using a Hino battery, is out and about being tested. In the next few years, I expect we'll start to see lower-end vehicles equipped with this much cheaper technology based on more abundant minerals. So material needs will shift dramatically depending on whether the dominant battery chemistry remains the same, which is by no means a given. Going back to the IEA report, it also mentions a shift in chemistry may occur as a result of the tight market for critical minerals. Some examples of that include manganese-rich chemistries, and further pushes towards LFP batteries. Let us know in the Discord or on Mastodon if you'd like us to do a deeper dive into upcoming battery technologies. So it's pretty clear that there are enough minerals, it's pretty clear that a big chunk of the investment is there, and there are reasonable odds that the investment in material extractions will occur. But the other concern that's levelled against EVs is that the extraction itself is incredibly damaging. So. The next question is, how bad is the mining? Okay, before we get down and dirty, we need to talk about something. Because while it's absolutely important to look at the picture of resource extraction for EVs, it's also important to consider what's going on right now. Because extracting minerals for EVs, or for making smartphones, or indeed battery-powered portable walrus polishing kits, cleans even the trickiest of sea-bound mammals isn't the only thing we extract minerals for. They're extracted for making plastics, pharmaceuticals, fertilisers, the ephemera of modern existence. And there's also another resource that is strip mined in much the same way as some mining for critical minerals. But unlike those minerals, this one is burned to make energy. Well, it's burned to produce electricity because you can't really make energy. All you can do is move it around. And that resource is coal. And because that's something that we've done for centuries, we tend to forget about the damage caused by that extraction. Or at least look past those problems. Now for each megawatt hour of electricity you need to burn about 1100 pounds of coal. That's about 500 kilos. Which doesn't sound that bad until you realise that the US currently generates about 22% of its electricity from coal, with over 200,000 megawatts of capacity in coal generation. And in 2021, 899 billion kilowatt hours of electricity was generated from coal. That means that the US burned around 448 billion kilos of coal. 
for every hour of every day of every week, we burned approximately 51 million kilos of coal. That's the contents of about seven fully laden, very best technology coal wagons, the shiniest and newest of which will carry about 143 tonnes of coal being burned every single minute. And burning each and every kilo of that coal produces nearly two and a half kilos of carbon dioxide. And that's before we've even got into the fact that about two tenths of the coal ends up as a highly toxic and unpleasant ash that we still have to deal with at the end of the process. Oh, and the methane produced. It's also before we get into the pollution produced from strip mines and from processing coal and the pollution and spills from that process or the long-term health issues produced and abuse of workers in historically disinvested communities by those rapacious coal industry owners. So let's not pretend that the status quo is some kind of kumbaya singing virtuous lack of pollution and resource extraction. And while I am not saying that we shouldn't be striving for better, I am saying that a lot of the discussions seem to have a curious disinterest in examining the fact that not decarbonizing means the status quo with its existing pollution remains. But the question in front of us is, what are the impacts of mining for critical battery minerals? Okay, so let's start with the positives, because there are some. Obviously, the thing that's most commonly cited as a positive impact is the rise in income for a region, along with the creation of a significant number of jobs, not just in the mines themselves, but also in associated sectors. Refining, processing the ore, potentially in battery manufacturing, those financial benefits tend to mostly be felt locally, but for reasons I'll come to in a bit, the workforce are often drawn from outside that region. But for remote and rural areas that have suffered from long-term population decline, the presence of a new industry can reverse that decline. Okay, that's kind of the good bit over, sadly. But unsurprisingly, digging a giant dirty hole in the ground can come with some negative impacts. We've seen here in the US and in other countries the despoiling of areas of significance to native and indigenous people. People who've often had their land stolen and the resources depleted, leaving historically and culturally significant land permanently damaged, or in the case of some sites, permanently destroyed. And at the same time, the damage to the environment, the loss of ancestral lands, and the influx of out-of-region workers can displace indigenous people away from these lands. Indeed, one notable quote from a relevant study is, resource extraction often occurs on indigenous lands and benefits least those who experience its negative impacts. While we have not historically been very good at respecting the rights of indigenous people, mistress of understatement there, there are increasing demands to try and work with indigenous peoples to try and more respectfully meet our societal desire not to give up the car and at the same time manage resource extraction. That's something I definitely see as a positive. Obviously, the thing that tends to get the most news coverage is catastrophic failures of the dams that hold mining tailings. Wet tailings, which are the most common way of storing fine and coarse waste dust produced by processing ore, which is then mixed with water to make them more kind of manageable. These tailings often contain toxins and heavy metals, and they're often stored in PVC-lined ponds. Unsurprisingly, during extreme weather events, or often when a mine has closed and maintenance is even more sketchy than it was when the mine was open, these ponds can leak, the dams can fail, and those incredibly toxic minerals can then escape and cause enormous damage. Reducing the generation of these materials or reducing their toxicity is obviously a very important way of reducing the risks mining poses to the immediate environment. The other main source of pollution from mines is chronic seepage, the most common of which is acid mine drainage. The sulphide minerals exposed by excavation react with oxygen in the atmosphere to generate an acidic toxic liquid that can, if poorly controlled, spread into and pollute the surroundings and into the groundwater. Mining for critical minerals also disrupts agriculture, which can be particularly impactful in areas where the primary source of income is growing food. In Bolivia, quinoa growers have persistently voiced concerns about the potential impacts of mining. Understandable, because dependent on the type of extraction there can, as we've mentioned, be pollution of the groundwater, 
or the enormous water demands of extraction from brine deposits can lead to water shortages. Although reportedly studies of mines extracting from rock deposits rather than brine have shown somewhat less pollution. Finally, lithium extraction can endanger ecotourism, which sounds like a small concern, but it's often the source of income in the unspoiled areas of outstanding natural beauty in which some deposits are located and a source of income that can have much less impact on the land itself. As I mentioned, there are essentially two common options for lithium extraction. Lithium can be extracted from brines or from pegmatite rock deposits. The latter is generally more destructive to the immediate environment. Having been dug up or drilled or explosively extracted, lithium ore is crushed and then intensively heated to make the ore into a more workable form. Once cooled, the concentrated ore is milled into a powdered form which is mixed with sulfuric acid and heated more. Calcium and magnesium are precipitated out and then sodium ash is added to make lithium precipitate out. Brine extraction tends to be achieved by pumping the brines from deep underground into evaporation ponds where they let the sun and wind do their thing. Which doesn't sound so bad, but then obviously that stuff that's evaporating has to go somewhere and the ponds which are filled with increasingly concentrated brine can also be a source of pollution if not properly maintained. Then, similar to the rock ore, various impurities have to be removed, often using solvents, and then there's the application of the good old soda ash. All of these have the potential to negatively impact land usage, spread pollution, damage flora and fauna, significantly increase waste generation and need for disposal, and impact land subsidence. But at the moment there's not enough data to really understand the full impact of lithium extraction. From other similar processes that we know that it's important to regulate and monitor these sites and also to explore more modern, less damaging extraction methods. Now of course some will argue that once a mine is done and dusted, extracting minerals, you can engage in the restoration of that land. However, examining the biome impacts of mining suggests that those impacts are long-lasting, unsurprisingly, and that mines also unsurprisingly do not engage in the acts needed to preserve the land to enable native flora and fauna to re-establish after extraction is done. Studies also suggest that the soil quality is significantly diminished by the impact of mining. That said, the sustainable bauxite mining guidelines do suggest some plans that might help ameliorate some of the damage. Okay, so that is all not ideal. You know, the traditional British understatement might not be conveying just how this could suck, in a similar way to the way that the fossil fuel industry has polluted and destroyed vast swathes of land and sea. So then, what can we do about it? So let's start right at the beginning, with extraction. As we've mentioned in a previous video, there are some pretty nifty things going on with brine extraction, but since we essentially made a chunk of video on that, I'm not going to talk about it right now. Instead, we're going to start with the limited but very interesting possibility of in situ recovery, also known as in situ leach or solution mining, where the ore is contained within a permeable rock using a quote, relatively benign chemical pumped down into the rock. Glycine is one example, ferric chloride another. The materials can be extracted without the damage and destruction normally seen at the surface. Test projects have been successful at extracting gold, silver, nickel, cobalt and copper using glycine. This system for extraction is already in use at around 1% of mines and has the unsurprising advantage of not generating huge piles of mining waste and leaving the ground relatively unscathed. And in a nod to where we're going next on our journey, the process can also be used to remove other toxic substances like arsenic from existing mine waste at the same time as extracting leftover minerals. This type of technique enables reprocessing of waste at both active and legacy mining sites to reduce both the risks of contamination from the waste and to more efficiently extract materials that we actually want. A pretty nifty trick to make dealing with potential pollutants and waste profitable. Now that's not the only way to reprocess the tailing waste generated in traditional mining processes, and tailing reprocessing is currently done in around 5% of active mining projects using a variety of methods. But this one is one way we can start to improve the long-term legacy of mining. Another related technique is desulfurization, 
an added step after processing that reduces the risk of that acid mine drainage that we talked about earlier. By removing the sulphides from the tailings, it reduces the formation of those acidic substances. And while this doesn't reduce the volume of the tailings, it makes storing them safer and easier. However, thanks to often lax regulatory climates, there's currently little financial incentive for desulphurization. Leakage and pollution is often a taxpayer expense rather than an originator expense, and until that changes, mines are unlikely to invest in these kinds of processes. Rather than storing those tailings wet with the risks of leaching toxins, another technique is to store them dry. This reduces the volume of land needed for storage, sometimes by more than 50%. It also massively reduces the water needs of the mine, but at the expense of greater energy use to dry the tailings which have to be drier than a Vulcan joke to be safely stored. I fail to understand. Now, what makes more sense than dealing with the mess afterwards is, like we said at the start of this, to make less mess. And outside of the fancy in-situ recovery, there's also a nifty trick called pre-concentration. Metallic elements naturally end up in the finer fractions of crushed rock from mining. So rather than processing all that rock by diverting the bigger bits away and only processing the finer bits, you can create less waste and use less energy. There's some pretty gunning tricks going on using high voltage pulses or microwaves to selectively heat and shatter just the bits of rock that contain useful ores. By doing this, you can generate 50% fewer fine tailings, although obviously you do end up with a significant pile of unprocessed rock, which means you could actually generate more waste overall. But by using pre-concentration in underground mines, you can create much lower impact from your mining process than, say, open pit mining. And finally, in our little high-speed run-through of waste management techniques, what other EV channel brings you mine waste management? We have the production of ore sand. Metallic ores often contain high proportions of silicates, which makes them suitable for converting into a substitute for natural sand. You might think, there's an awful lot of sand in the world, why would we want more? Well, building glass manufacturing, ceramics, abrasives and solar panels all require sand which has specific characteristics. Characteristics that aren't as common in natural sand as you might think. While ore sand is considered a new concept, Coming from the UK, where it was common practice for coal dust to be mixed into scratch coats of lime plaster, replacing some of the sand content, it's also rehashing an old but effective idea. Ore sand generally requires some of those other steps we talked about, desulphurization and dewatering, but it does provide an immediate financial benefit, and it means that instead of ending up with a useless pile of waste, we're actually using the majority of the stuff pulled from the ground. Of course, one significant thing that we can do to reduce our mining going forward is to build up our recycling strategies and work towards a circular economy. We've seen Europe tentatively move towards this, with one study I found suggesting that by 2050, with appropriate policies in place, more than half of Europe's cobalt needs could be met by circular economy reuse. And by encouraging people to buy smaller vehicles with batteries that meet their actual, not their perceived needs, maybe by legislating in a way that makes larger, less resource-efficient vehicles pay for their impact. Perhaps we in the US could remove the exemptions that allow SUVs and light trucks to be more profitable than selling smaller, more efficient vehicles. Realistically, all of these are low-hanging fruit. The biggies that would massively reduce our needs, shifting people into walkable urban environments, by, for example, ending the US's dubious and inequitable love affair with single-family zoning and by pouring a chunk of change from fossil fuel subsidies into instead building up public transport and working to change people's perception of it. But that wasn't the question for today. The questions in front of us are, are there enough materials? Yes, we're good for a while. Is mining not currently great for the environment? Sure. Is it worse than the status quo? Probably not. And can we do better? Yes. And realistically, we must. But the other thing we can and should do is reduce our need for these new resources that we require from the ground anyway. And on that note, we are done with today's video. 
If you liked it, you know what to do, and feel free to tip us with a Kofi or a super thanks or indeed Bitcoin. Our Discord chat room is open for your thoughts. Link down there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find a link to our swag store. And check us out on Mastodon, we have our very own server. Scrolling by on my right is our list of amazing charged up supporters. And shout outs go to our self driving tier supporters Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Anthony Coates, Bennett Elder, Bill Kelly, Brian Newton, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Chris Center, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, David Janakula, Denny Hyde, Gordon C., Guido Drahota, Hey Eska, Jim Burness, John Trammell, Kyle Fox, Kyle Hodgson, Lance Shaw, Linda Irish, Mark Eggleton, Michael Goad, Mike Weeder, Paul Nelson, Pedro Muro Pinheiro, Peter Dillinger, Raging Fellows, Ricky Leong, Sean Tucker, Tezza in the Gong, Tobias Stroh, Tony Moss, and Zachary Courtney. Finally, out of this world, thanks to our Starman supporters, Aaron Han, Andrew Glenn, Blue Says Hello, Christopher Jones, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Dave Kitchen, Ellery Hensley, Eric Knack, JP Fagerback, Joe Bresney, Joe Hughes, John L. Henderson, Kevin Burbridge, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S., Paul Conway, Reggie Watts, Robert Flannery, Rory Litwin, S. Bowen Zenner, Stephen O'Donoghue, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. You have no idea how many takes this has taken. We'll be back soon with more videos, but until then, keep evolving.